Hello, Energy Express friends! It's me, Joel, and welcome back to another episode. Have you ever wondered how something works, or how the bridges are built, or how a car goes? Well, that's all part of engineering, and today is all about engineering. I want to introduce you to my friend, Kate Schlobaum, who is going to host you today and read you a great book and teach you a fun experiment. Kate? Hi, my name is Kate Schlobaum, and I work at West Virginia University's Statler College of Engineering and Mineral Resources. I'm really excited to be here with you today so we can talk a little bit about engineering, how it relates to children's books, and the engineering design process. We're even going to do a fun demonstration at the end relating back to the book that we read. One of my very favorite things about reading books to my own children is that when there's a character who faces a problem, that means you get to come up with the solution to fix the problem. And so when I'm reading to my own kids, I'm always trying to get them to think about what is the problem and how could we fix it for the character. So in any children's book that you read, that's something that you can identify. And if you do that, you'll really be thinking like an engineer. Today, we're gonna read a book that hopefully you've read before, or at least you know you're familiar with. Um, it's called If You Give a Mouse a Cookie. It's by Laura Numeroff, and it's illustrated by Felicia Bond. So I'm gonna read this book to you, and then after that, we're gonna talk a little bit about what an engineer even is, talk about the design process that they use to solve problems every day, and then we're gonna do a fun demonstration with items that you might have around your own home. So let's read the book. If you give a mouse a cookie. If you give a mouse a cookie, he's going to ask for a glass of milk. When you give him the milk, he'll probably ask for a straw. When he's finished, he'll ask for a napkin. Then he'll want to look in the mirror to make sure he doesn't have a milk mustache. When he looks in the mirror, he might notice that his hair needs a trim. So he'll probably ask for a pair of nail clippers. When he's finished giving himself a trim, he'll want a broom to sweep up. He'll start sweeping. He might get carried away and sweep every room in the house. He may even end up washing the floors as well. When he's done, he'll probably want to take a nap. You'll have to fix up a little box for him with a blanket and a pillow. He'll crawl in, make himself comfortable, and fluff the pillows a few times. He'll probably ask you to read him a story. So you'll read to him from one of your books and he'll ask to see the pictures. When he looks at the pictures, he'll get so excited that he wants to draw one of his own. He'll ask for paper and crayons. He will draw a picture. When the picture is finished, he will want to sign his name with a pen. Then he'll want to hang his picture on your refrigerator which means he'll need scotch tape. He'll hang up his drawing and stand back to look at it. Looking at the refrigerator will remind him that he's thirsty. So he'll ask for a glass of milk and chances are if he asks for a glass of milk he's going to want a cookie to go with it. So that's the end of this book. We're gonna talk about the problem that this character faced and how you, thinking like an engineer, could solve that problem. Engineers are always looking for problems in the world, but they're not looking for problems because they're negative. They're looking for problems because they're looking for ways to make your life easier, better, safer, or cooler. So they'll take those problems and they'll find creative solutions to make the world a better place. It's a really exciting career in anything that you're interested in, whether it be dance, sports, TV, video games. 
uh, health, medicine, anything along those lines, you'll be able to relate it back to engineering because engineering touches every aspect of life. So engineers use a process called the engineering design pro process to solve problems. And we're gonna walk through that a little bit before we do our demonstration and before we talk about the mouse and his cookie. So the engineering design process starts by first knowing what is your problem. In this book that we just read, the problem was that the mouse might want something each time he has the thing before it. So if he had a cookie, he's gonna need a napkin and so forth. So engineers are thinking about what is the problem and how can we get the solution. So the first step is to identify your problem. The problem is your mouse is gonna need a lot of things. Next, after you have your problem identified, then you're going to have to think about what are all of the possible solutions. And this is a really fun part of the engineering design process. We call it brainstorming. When you're brainstorming, nothing is off the table. You get to think about any solution that you can think of. So no matter if it's a wild idea or it would cost a ton of money, you can still think of it because it's a possible solution. We'll talk about narrowing it down here in a little bit. So when you're brainstorming, you can draw pictures, you can um, write ideas. And again, like I said, the wilder the better because sometimes those really wild ideas are what, what are the next really cool inventions. So now that you had time to brainstorm, the next step is you're going to bring all of those ideas to one usable idea, and that's called your plan. So in the plan phase, this is where you really narrow it down and you think about what your constraints are. So a constraint is the engineering word I really want you to take away today, and a constraint is something that limits you from solving a problem in a certain way. So what are some constraints that we might typically run into? Um, money is a big one, so we're always talking about our budget. We're always talking about how much we can spend to solve a problem. So even though you might have a really great solution to a problem, it might be too expensive and that might not be a great way to go about solving it. Other constraints that engineers face a lot are time. So I always use the example of if somebody's fixing the roads, we want them to do it as quick as possible so that we're not delayed in traffic. So um, time and deadlines become really important to engineers and we're always limited by when somebody wants the project completed by. Another constraint that people have, of course, is safety and policy. So, you know, just because there's a great way or a way that you think might be a good way to solve a problem, if it's not the safest way, we don't want to do it. So I'm in a room right now with really tall ceilings and if the lights went out uh, and I wanted to change the light bulb, I could stack my stools one on top of the other uh, or climb on top of the table or maybe even put a stool on top of the table to get to that because that's what I have in the room with me uh, and it would be really quick and it would be a way to solve the problem, but it's not the safest way to solve the problem. That would be really dangerous. Uh, so I would want to go get a ladder and you know maybe get a friend to help me and make sure that I'm being as safe as possible. It's also really important for engineers to think about safety because people use the products and processes that engineers come up with. So safety becomes a huge uh, factor that we have to think about. You know, we don't want people flying in airplanes or driving across bridges that we don't feel safe or good about. So those are some constraints that we might run into. So again, a constraint is the word I want you to learn today is something that limits the way an engineer solves a problem. And a constraint can even be if you're working for somebody, they might have a very specific way that they want things to be built. So for example, if you're in um, the woods and you need to build a shelter, you're probably gonna use leaves, trees, things like that to, to build your shelter with. But if you're in the desert, you're gonna use very different materials to solve that problem and to build your shelter. So materials are gonna limit you and then what your client or the person you're working for wants is going to limit you as well. So always be aware of those when you're thinking about how to solve a problem because you don't wanna put in a lot of effort to solve a problem and then find out you don't have the budget, the time, the materials, or it's not what the person's looking for. So when you have your plan, this is where if you're working in a team like engineers do a lot, you might delegate jobs to other people. And what's it mean to delegate? So to delegate is to take a really big um, project or goal and to break it into smaller parts. So this would be something, say we wanted to design a car. Not one single person is going to design a car all by themselves. So we're gonna break it into smaller teams. We might have the team that works on the exterior of the car and the body of the car. There might be a team that works on all the electrical components in the car. Somebody might work on the inside and the comfort and the style of the car. Uh, and then there's the whole other side of the team where people are gonna help us with marketing and selling the car and 
testing it to make sure it's safe as it can, it's as safe as it can be. So there's a really big team. And so when we want to just simply build a car, we have to break it into smaller parts. So that's all part of the plan. So when you're planning, if you're on a team, you want to make sure everybody understands what their role on the team is. And we want to make sure that they under, they have an active role because everybody on the team wants to feel like they're a part of it and that they're helping to solve the problem. Also, when you're planning, this would be a really good time to draw your design. Uh, some people learn different ways, but a lot of people can learn visually. So if you have an idea about how to solve a problem, sometimes just explaining it to your team members, people don't really understand what you, what you mean. So if you draw a picture, you might realize, oh, that's what you meant, and you'll work together to solve it in the way that you're thinking. Or your teammates might say, oh, okay, now that I can see what you're saying, it's not gonna quite work, so why don't we change it this way? Uh, and that's part of the teamwork. So as you're planning, your, your overall plan might evolve and that's totally okay. So now that you have identified the problem and you brainstormed all the possible ideas, you've come up with one single plan that you wanna move forward with, now's the fun part. Now this is a step that everybody always wants to jump into and this is the phase called create. This is where you get to put your plan into action. You get to start building, you get to start um, putting your plan into action and really seeing it come to life. So it's really fun. So after we create, uh, engineers are analytical. They wanna think about how things work. So we have to make sure that we've built or designed our product. Did it work? Did it meet our goals? Is it what we want it to be? So the next step after create is to test and analyze. So we're gonna test, we're gonna think about does it meet our goal? Is it what we want? Um, is the client going to be happy? Did we come in under or at the budget? Did we come in under or at the time? You're going to think about all of these things to think, were you successful? And I think this is one of the things that's really hard for people is that sometimes you're not successful. And you know what? That's okay. So sometimes engineers, just like everybody, fail at things. And you know what we do with that? We learn and then we try again because it's not the end of the world. So if it didn't work or it didn't meet our goal, totally fine, we're gonna move forward. And that's why the engineering design process is kind of like a circle because you're always gonna keep going through that process over and over. Even if your product or process did work and it met all your goals and you're pretty happy with the way it turned out, it could always be better. And so that's why with the engineering design process, you're never actually done. It can always be safer, easier, better, or cooler. And engineers are always thinking about how can we make it one of those things. We're going to use simple machines to solve a problem today. Um, and thinking about that engineering design process and also thinking about our book, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie. We're gonna continue thinking in those if this happens, then that will happen kind of statements. So first, let's cover what are simple machines. So there are six different simple machines, and what a simple machine is, is an object with little to no moving parts that redirects forces to make a job easier for someone to do. So that sounds really complicated, right? You use simple machines all the time, and you don't even realize it. So I'm gonna give you the list of the six, and then I want you to look around your house or your room, and I want you to think about where do you see these simple machines every day and where are you using them that you didn't even realize it? Again, like I mentioned, engineering is in every part of your life and you can't get away from it because it's so cool. So I printed out, I don't know if you can see, this is a list of the six simple machines. So first we have an inclined plane. That's just a fancy way to say ramp. So where might you have ramps in your everyday life? Maybe if you're pushing something up into a car, you might have a ramp. Um, you know, and it can be as simple as you take a book that you just read and you roll something up the book to help you get it to a higher height. Uh, you would do this a lot of times if something was heavy, too heavy to pick up and lift up the stairs. A lot of times you might also see ramps at accessible entrances for people in wheelchairs or things like that. So it's just another way to move something from a low position to a high position or the opposite way. Another simple machine is wheel and axle. And so, the really common place that you would see a wheel and axle um, that you would immediately think of is your car. So I have some little uh, block cars that have their wheel and axles here where you can actually see that the axle is the part that the wheel spins on. And this would be something that you would use to move objects, again, that are too heavy to move by yourself. Um, and that's again where simple machines try to make hard work easier for people. So a wheel and axle is another simple machine that you could use in your Rube Goldberg. 
Another less common place that you might think of a wheel and axle, but you have them all over your house, is a doorknob. So if you know how a doorknob works, there's an axle, and then the knob is actually like a wheel that turns. So you're using those wheel and axles every single day to get in and out of places. A wedge is another simple machine that you might be familiar with. Uh, a wedge is gonna be, a, a, it's designed to usually break apart or split something in half. So think about if you were chopping wood, you're gonna use an ax, and an ax is shaped like a wedge, so it's skinny at the front and it gets wider towards the back. So that'll help split something apart. The next simple machine is a screw. So screws aren't only for hanging things on the wall or putting wood together, or something like that. You also use screws on things like jar lids. So if you've ever screwed a jar lid on or off, then you're using a simple machine, and that one is the screw. Next, you have a lever. So you use levers all the time. Uh, the easy one that everybody always thinks of is a seesaw. So there's a center point or a point that the board balances across and it goes back and forth. So the weight can move up or the weight can move down depending on how the center piece is placed. But this, it's going to move up and down. Another lever that you use in your everyday life is your light switch. So when you flip it up or down, then it's a lever. Finally, a pulley system. So a pulley is a simple machine that does kind of have some moving parts, but basically a pulley is gonna help redistribute the weight and make it easier to lift something or to move something to a higher location. So you might use pulleys in fishing reels. Um, if you've ever helped put a flag up a, up a pole, then you've used a pulley system. So you use these things in your everyday life. Like I said, there's six of them. And the whole point of simple machines is to take hard work and make it easier. And again, that's engineers thinking about how can they make your life easier, better, safer, cooler. They're trying to make it easier by implementing simple machines to make work easier for you. When I read, if you give a mouse a cookie, it gets me thinking about an engineering project called a Rube Goldberg. And a Rube Goldberg is basically an overcomplicated system of small reactions that cause a bigger reaction. So think about the game Mousetrap. Think about your goal at the end is to actually catch the mouse, a pretty simple goal in a board game. But if you've ever played the game, you have all these simple machines and simple processes that have to happen to make that cage fall down at the end over top of the mouse. And so with a Rube Goldberg, it's the same idea. You'll have one object or process that will start the next object or process to complete a final task. And again, they're overcomplicated to be fun. They're fun, I, fun things to see if you can solve problems. And again, that's thinking like an engineer. So the book, To Give a Mouse a Cookie, is kind of like that. Every step is if this happens, then that will happen. So if you give him a glass of milk, then he will want a cookie. If you give him a cookie, then he will need a napkin. So there's a bunch of if-then statements. And so with a Rube Goldberg, it's the same idea. We could have, if you knock over these dominoes, then this tennis ball will roll across the table. Or if this pulley lifts up an object, then the counterweight will make something else drop and fall. So a Rube Goldberg is a really fun way to make, um, to put the engineering design process into action. And the really fun part about them is you really can't do them wrong. Uh, sometimes they might not work exactly like you thought they would, but then you'll just naturally use your problem solving skills to make it work. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today. And we're gonna use some simple machines to create a Rube Goldberg. All right, so now is the fun part. We're gonna take what we've learned about the engineering design process, as well as simple machines, and we're gonna combine everything to design and build and test our very own Rube Goldberg. So remember, a Rube Goldberg is a set of, or is a series of tasks in a very complicated system to complete a simple task. So for us, we're going to set up a Rube Goldberg with the goal of dropping this tennis ball into a basket like this. Pretty simple, right? We don't really need a bunch of steps to do that. I could just drop it in with my hand, but where's the fun in that? So with a Rube Goldberg, you can make it have as many steps as you want. So again, think about the game Mousetrap. There's so many steps from the seesaw with the diver that has to go into the pool before the, th the cage comes down over the mice. So we can make it have as many steps as we want. What I'm gonna challenge you to do is to create a Rube Goldberg using all six of the simple machines that we talked about. 
So you can use household objects. There's no right or wrong material to use in a Rube Goldberg. Anything can be used. Um, I've built them with my own kids using things like boxes of macaroni and cheese, uh, all kinds of their toys and superheroes. So whatever you have around your house, feel free to use it. Today, we're gonna use um, some simple materials that I had laying around my stem zone. Uh, and it's gonna, be, it's gonna be fun. I don't even know what some of them are gonna turn into yet. So you're gonna be learning right along with me. So we have rulers. So to me, when I see a ruler, uh, I see one of two things. I either see a lever, so we could use it to move something up or down like this on a fulcrum or a center point, or I see a ramp, so we could use it to push something up or to let something slide down. So this ruler, while some people might just use it to measure, can also be used as a simple machine or two. So again, don't get caught up with that's not the way it's supposed to be used because engineering is all about creativity and finding new ways to solve problems. Um, another thing that we're gonna use are marbles. So I've got a whole bunch of marbles here. Uh, and again, like I said, not 100% sure yet what we're gonna do with them, but we're gonna use the marbles in our Rube Goldberg. I also have a bunch of cardboard tubes. So you probably have these in your house, uh, and a lot of times people just throw them away. They don't even think about all the great stuff you can do with them. But I've got ones from toilet paper and ones from paper towels. So again, don't feel limited that these can only be a tube and that you might use them for supports or things like that. Think about all the ways you could use them. You can cut them, you can make them more like gutters or shoots, you can tape them together. So you're only limited by your own creativity. If you have some Legos or connects around your house, uh, they're a great thing to add into your Rube Goldberg system because they can truly be anything. So I used some connects uh, and I made a simple machine. So I made a wheel and axle. And so again, I'm thinking in our Rube Goldberg, this is probably gonna be used to move something from point A to point B, uh, but let's wait and see what we've got. And then I have um, some yarn. Yarn is gonna be very important in our Rube Goldberg. So yarn or string or floss of some sort. Uh, we'll, be, we'll probably use it in multiple places when we make our final design. And then I have this empty um, hot chocolate canister. So it's just a empty canister that we've washed out. Uh, we made all the hot chocolate. And I don't know what this is gonna be, but this trash looked too usable to throw away, so I kept it. And I'm really excited because today, it's gonna turn into something awesome. So feel free, go look around your house, see what you have available, and then let's get started. We're gonna start building. So we know what our problem is. Our problem is we need to figure out a way to drop that tennis ball into that basket. So now we're gonna brainstorm. We're gonna think about all the possible ways. So we see what our materials and tools are. We know what our constraints are because we're constrained by our time because we can't do this all day long. Uh, and we are constrained by the materials that we have as well as budget. We probably aren't gonna go out and buy a whole bunch of extra supplies to build a Rube Goldberg. So we know all that. So now let's brainstorm our possible solutions. I'll give you a couple of minutes and I'm gonna start building mine. So when we come back, I will already have some things in place for it. All right, welcome back. So I hope you were able to come up with some ideas for your very own Rube Goldberg. I worked on mine while we were away. And what you didn't see is there was a lot of trial and error. So some things that I tried, it didn't work and I had to go back to the drawing board, which is totally fine because using that engineering design process, when I tested it, if it didn't work, I learned from that and then I moved on and tried a new plan. And that's totally fine, it happens all the time. So I had a lot of mistakes. I had um, some interesting ideas that might work. Uh, we're gonna do the final test here together in just a minute. And remember, our goal is to drop the tennis ball into that little white basket. So uh, I used some materials that I'll show you here in just a minute, but I did add in some Play-Doh and some dominoes. And I forgot to mention, tape is going to be your best friend. So make sure you have some tape on hand when you do this. So I'm gonna show you my design and we're gonna test it together. So if it works, I'm gonna be very excited, but if it doesn't work, that's okay because we can always use our problem solving skills to make some small adjustments to make it work. I'm going to walk you through how I think my design should work and then we're gonna test it to see if it really does what we think it will. So the first thing I used was I used one of these paper towel tubes. Uh, I taped it to the wall and I'm using it kind of like a ramp or a chute so that I can drop a large marble down through it and it's going to direct it to where I want it to go. So the next thing I'm gonna use is this lever system. So again, this is a simple machine. Uh, I used a ruler, a tennis ball, Play-Doh, two baskets, 
and a whole lot of tape. So the idea here is that my marble will come rolling out of the tube, land right there in that white basket. And then the next step would be this yellow basket has some yarn tied to it. That yarn is tied around our hot chocolate canister. And so once the marble hits the white bucket, then the yellow bucket will lift, pulling that yellow string and then pulling that canister away from underneath of the tube. So this is another cardboard tube cut to be more like a chute or a slide for a tennis ball. I taped it to the wall and as soon as that canister comes out from underneath of it, hopefully the tennis ball is going to roll down it like a slide. After that, I used my wheel and axle. The tennis ball is gonna hit the wheel and axle that I made out of Connex. And hopefully, again, we're gonna test this together, that wheel and axle is gonna move forward just enough to bump my dominoes. My dominoes, if everything goes well, will then release this string that's tied to a stool. And so what you can see I've done here is I've used this string kind of like a screw. So I wrapped it around that center post there a few times and when the domino releases the string, like a screw, it's gonna unwind and hopefully this pulley system that I used in the top of the stool will lower the tennis ball from its position here into the white basket. So like I mentioned, a Rube Goldberg is an overly complicated system to complete a simple task. That simple task for us is dropping this tennis ball into this white bucket. So let's test it and see if it works the way I hope it will. And here we go. We're gonna try with our marble again. Ready, set, go. Oh no. We had our first test and it didn't work. So I had to reset everything um, and that's fine because we're gonna try it again. One thing that I learned was that the marbles, or I'm sorry, that the tennis ball wasn't heavy enough to pull the string down. So I added some marbles to the end of it. So let's give it another shot and see how it goes. Step one, marble goes into the white bucket. So we tried and we tried and I tried a lot of times and it didn't exactly work the way we want to. So that's okay. I reset it multiple times and each time I had to change something just a little bit. So if yours isn't working, that's okay. Just keep trying. And I promise if you put in enough effort and you try to solve the problem enough times, you too will be able to solve the problem. Hey Energy Express friends, did you have a fun day? I know I did. Well, we'll see you again soon for more fun and more activities. Have a good one, bye-bye.